Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau, and filling in for Dan Pfeiffer while he's on vacation, Hysteria's own Aaron Ryan. Aaron, welcome. Oh, John, it's always great to be here. You make me feel like I fit in like a weapon in Madison Cawthorn's carry-on luggage. (laughs) I'm glad you're here. We were supposed to be in studio together, um, but I have COVID, so uh, we are all... We are all isolating at home, uh, the whole family. We're, we're, all, um, we're all fine so far, so just annoying. Very happy to be vaccinated and boosted. Yeah, it, it's, it's like um, at this point, if you're vaccinated and boosted, it's sort of like getting a lottery ticket. But like all the scratch-off options are just terrible, and you're like, I want the least bad option. Yep. So yeah. it's, I'm glad that you've got like the least – it sounds like among the yeah. least bad I'm, options – I'm probably the worst in the family, and I have like uh, I would qualify. I would I would classify it as like a bad cold. Emily is asymptomatic, and Charlie has poor Charlie has a little cough, but is still him uh, still himself. So there's nothing we're all more humbling. That way. Nothing more humbling than a, a baby out braving you. You know, totally. He was like he was like he was very happy that I came back into the house because I was isol- isolating myself. Um, so he's been like sitting on my lap watching truck videos and YouTube for the last oh hour my God. before this pod. I'm like extremely needle phobic. Like when I get blood drawn, I have to like lie down and like breathe or whatever. And, uh, the last time my daughter had blood drawn, she took a nap. Like it's embarrassing. <laughs> She's so much bra- Babies are so much braver. They than really me. are. They really are. Yeah. No, I take a lesson. Um, All right. On today's show, we got some good news and bad news about Joe Biden's agenda. We got House Republicans in disarray. And later, the host of Crooked's newest pod, Hot Take, join us for a special climate edition of Take Appreciator. All right. So let's start with some good news and bad news about Joe Biden's agenda. The good news uh, is that two Democratic House members told The Washington Post that during a meeting with the Congressional Hispanic Caucus this week, the president, quote, gave his strongest indication yet that he is prepared not only to extend the current moratorium on student debt, but poised to take significant action to relieve student loans altogether, a move that could include canceling tens of thousands of dollars in debt for some people and one that he wants to take sooner rather than later. Biden himself confirmed on Thursday that a final decision will come in a few weeks. So that's great. Now for the bad news. Also from the Washington Post, Jeff Stein, Uh, Joe Manchin. We haven't said Joe Manchin in so long on this pod, and now now we're back. Mm. Uh, Joe Manchin has started meeting with Republican senators about a bipartisan energy bill, causing, quote, real fear in the White House that they'll fail to reach a deal with the West Virginia senator on a Democrat-only reconciliation bill that would invest in clean energy, lower the cost of prescription drugs, raise taxes on the rich, and cut the deficit for policies that Manchin keeps saying he supports. Um... Let's start with the good. So, Aaron, what are your thoughts on the student debt news, and, and what do you make of the timing on this? Uh, well, I'm for it. I, I'm going to say I'm a, I'm one of those people who had to take out a lot of loans to go to college and paid them all off. I think I paid them all off like in 2018 or 2019, and it was like a huge burden up until the point that I paid them off. And as someone who paid my loans off, I don't want other people to have to go through that for like the entire – young adulthood that they live to like have that sort of burden on their back. So I'm, I am I love this news. And I also want to sort of reframe the conversation on student loans. I think that national media is, is doing this thing where they're making it seem like an, or they're giving oxygen to the argument, the Republican argument, that this is a bailout for like pencil necks who, you know, keep going to more and more grad school because they, you know, whatever, they, they're like the elite. But yeah. if you take a look at who takes out student loans, who are they? They're people who can't pay for college out of pocket. So they're people who aren't coming from money. They're people who are maybe uh, – who maybe – their families didn't plan for them to go to college. They're people who are maybe first-generation college graduates. Um, and so they're people who come from one place and are going to another place. They're upwardly mobile people. They're the future middle class. And I think that it's really important for when we talk about this to keep in mind that people who take out student loans and the people who are most burdened by student loans are the future middle class or people that are trying to better their lives, also disproportionately people of color. And so I think that this is only a good move for Democrats, um, and it's only a good move for Americans. And I I just really want to make sure that when we talk about student loans, who we have in mind for who's taking them out is the right picture, a picture that matches reality. 
And I do think that it, it seems like from what Biden has said and what the White House has hinted at, that he might take action to make sure that um, people who need the help the most get it and that mm -hmm. people who are like very wealthy and can afford to pay off their student loans do not get this uh, sort mm -hmm. of debt relief. Um, of course, Republican senators reacted to the story by saying they're introducing a bill that would prevent Biden from canceling student debt. And Mitt Romney called it a desperate bribe on Wednesday. Um, oh you think Biden and the Democrats should lean into this fight? Yeah, I, I also think that it's funny that Mitt Romney, this is he should be above this. Like doing something that tangibly benefits your constituents is not a bribe. It's called being an elected official representing the public interest. <laughs> like that's not a, what's a tax cut then? What is uh, what is getting a contract awarded to your district? Like it's not a bribe. It's not I, here. It's so funny because look, I, Mitt Romney over the last couple of years has made some, I would say, principled and and even courageous uh, decisions around Trumpism that I, I applaud. They were just the right thing to do. I realize the bar is low, but it was still the right thing to do. A lot of other Republicans weren't doing it. But Mitt Romney complaining about student debt reminds me of why we were able to beat him in 2012. And I was, and it sort of made me miss that Republican Party that was just uh -huh. so open about how they're for helping. He complained about a wealth tax in that tweet too. You know, he's like, I saw Paul Ryan the other day too said that he was he was disappointed with Donald Trump for not talking more about cutting entitlements because Donald Trump was too afraid to do that. And I'm like, bring back that Republican Party and we'll kick their ass. Because <laughs> I'm like, picturing like Mitt Romney, you know, having his servants uh, get the Sunday newspaper and sitting there reading it in a top hat as someone polishes his shoes, and he's like, too many coupons. There's too many coupons in this newspaper. <laughs> it's like, come on, man. Like, this is this is not uh, the way that he's framing his concern with it is so, so cheap. And and here's the thing. The only legitimate pushback on the student loan thing, even semi legitimate, I'm not even saying I agree with this, is the idea that inflation is something um, that might be exacerbated by people continuing to have the amount of money that they have to spend, which right. I don't agree with, but that's like, you know, somewhat legit of an argument. It's a little bit wonky. It's a little bit in the weeds, but it's, you know, that would be a legitimate thing to bring up in the discussion. And this, it, it's a bribe. Uh, other people, like, when does Mitt Romney even know how to fill out a FAFSA form? I would challenge him to. I don't think he, I don't think he knows what FAFSA is. Yeah. I mean, I look. Uh... Also, it's like, yeah, no, we're really, this is a bribe. This is like a, a special dispensation for, uh, you know, hardworking students or, or people who've uh, worked hard to pay off their student student loans. But like, let's think about oil companies getting tax breaks, health insurance companies getting tax breaks. Uh, Donald Trump passed a giant tax cut for, for some of the wealthiest people in this country. Like, they didn't have any problem giving like very big corporations and the wealthiest individuals huge tax breaks that continue to this day. Mm -hmm. um, and, and look, they, I think... Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, and they and they didn't have a problem when Donald Trump was threatening to slow down people getting stimulus checks in the mail because he wanted his signature on the stimulus checks. Like, of course. it's it, it's exhausting. I'm, and I'm sorry, I interrupted you. No, I was just going to say it, it. It's also you know just to talk about the politics of it. Um, like Harvard, the, Harvard did a poll uh, this week. It's the Harvard Youth Poll. It's probably one of the best polls of, of young voters in the country. Um, they they surveyed a total of 2018 to 29 year olds. Uh, of that poll, 85% said they favor some form of government action on student loan. Only 38% favor total debt cancellation, which I actually think this is probably where Biden ends up landing. And they ended up doing focus groups in addition to the poll. And they said that some focus group participants were asking whether a person making hefty wages on Wall Street should have their debts washed clean or whether relief should only be given to those in dire need. So you can you can see how Biden will probably land on something that um, means tests this in some way, just so that it appears as fair as possible to most people in the country. But there is a desire among most young people and probably just most people in the country to have some kind of student debt relief. So it is it is a popular policy that he should absolutely lean, in, lean into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I also think that on the on the timing of this too, like people are like, well, why did he wait so long to do it? Well, I do think there is a risk in doing this by executive actions, that by executive order that the court turns it over. 
uh, the court overturns this. And um, I think that uh, he would have rather had legislation passed to cancel up to $10,000 in student in debt. But, you know, we're about to talk about this. Uh, it doesn't seem like the Democratic Congress that includes Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema ever would have gotten that done. And so he sort of had to wait. I'm, I'm sure he wanted to do it via legislation first. And when he couldn't do it now, now he's just going to do it via executive action. Mm -hmm. And there's something here that also kind of sticks out to me. So when Republicans want to get something deeply unpopular enacted or overturned, usually they just kind of lean on their shady ass judges and don't try to do it legislatively because what they do now is just gum up legislation and wait for court challenges to undo popular laws, essentially. Like that's, that's the right. way that that's the way that they do things. Um, yeah. So the fact that they are proposing counter legislation that's like we need to stop this from happening to me betrays a confidence that they have that their branding of student loan forgiveness will resonate with their voters like they they believe that they have successfully made it seem as though student loan forgiveness is an issue that impacts like you know pajama boy style <laughs> it's a throwback like white Love liberals that. you know like trigger warning on syllabus ch you know put tearing down staff they they believe that their extremely online angry twitter facebook base will come out to vote for them or be angered by this so that's that's one thing that i that i also am kind of kind of sticks out to me when we talk about like the timing and the way that we're talking about it. Yeah. And I think they're just, you know, I think they're sort of misreading the electorate on this one. Again, I, I, I if they want to introduce legislation to keep people in debt, great, go for it. Run on mm -hmm. that. You have like, yeah. you already have Rick Scott out there saying, I want to raise taxes on 100 million Americans. I want to take away uh, people's health care. I want to cut Social Security. I want to get rid of Social Security and Medicare after five years. And now we're going to throw onto the pile. Oh, and by the way, I want to prevent debt relief for millions of people in this country. Like, great, run on that. That, that'd, be, that'd be perfect. Um, so let's talk about the, um, the less good news here. Uh, the the mansion stuff. So there's a Politico story from yesterday where uh, former Harry Reid advisor Jim Manley said that if the White House is still hopeful about a deal with Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema, quote, someone is taking too many edibles. Um, if <laughs> I was like, I don't okay. wait. Yeah. So, it sounds like somebody doesn't know what edibles do. They don't make me hopeful. They, that was my that was my reaction. I'm like, is he is he taking edibles? <laughs> yeah, like they just make you want to. I mean, if if legislation was being introduced in like cartoon form like rick and morty <laughs> memes i would be like somebody's taking too many edibles but regardless that's that's nitpicky if if um but if you're the if you're the white house what at this point do you do about joe manchin wasting even more time here we are in april uh of of 2022 uh, several months before the midterms and what do you do about joe manchin wasting more time talking to republicans about a bipartisan energy deal that let's be honest, does not seem like uh, it will ever come to anything that would actually put a dent in climate change. I mean, here's the thing about Joe Manchin, though. Like, his popularity since he has mm -hmm. taken on this role has yep. skyrocketed among the people who have the power to elect him or not elect him. In West Virginia, I think Trump won by double digits. Yep. And he's a, a Democrat from a deep red state. And uh, in the past year, according to a morning consult poll, um, his approval rating has risen in his state from 40% to 57%. Yeah. So in his mind, he's doing all the right things. So what Democrats need to somehow do is to make him understand that he's doing the wrong things. And by that, they somehow need to message to West Virginians. And and I don't know what that looks like. I'm not from West Virginia. And I do know that, you know, sending uh, sending people into West Virginia has had some mixed results um, because Joe Manchin is basically the, the king of West Virginia at this point, driving around in his Maserati like a goon. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> uh, yeah, a, a Maserati. Car people know that Maseratis are bad cars, right? Like it's that's like a just like the ultimate douchey car. I know. Like, if you see a Maserati, even in Los Angeles, you're like, that 
douche. And this is a city full of Teslas. Like it's a. I thought anyway. you were gonna say it's a, and this is a city full of douches, which I'm like, you it, know, that's douches also, and also Teslas. True. I mean, it's like it it, it 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 elevates you among the baseline of douchiness of L.A. I can't even imagine the differential in 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 West Virginia. But regardless, he's super popular in West Virginia. So how do Democrats get the message across that Biden's agenda? benefits West Virginians without seeming as though they're confronting Joe Manchin or undermining Joe Manchin. Like they have to somehow message around him in a way. It's, it's I think it's really hard. I mean, I think the question like through the last couple of years has been, what does Joe Manchin really want? Which is a ridiculously hard question to answer because it doesn't seem like he knows what the fuck he wants half the time. Um, and he'll like say something to reporters one day, something opposite the other day. Um I, I've heard that he will tell Democratic senators like, hey, I really love that plan. And then they'll call the White House and say, oh, Joe Manchin wants that, wants my plan included in the in the reconciliation bill. And then the White House calls Joe Manchin and he's like, no, I never said that. So he's like playing all sides all the time. And then uh. he recently he recently apparently told donors at a dinner that he's um, that he's running again in 2024. And thinking about the poll numbers that you just cited, like, I, I had always wondered, I'm like, does he really think he's going to win in 2024 in West Virginia in a state that Trump won by that many points um, when it's only going to get more conservative because we only get more polarized as the years go on? Mm -hmm. And the fact that not only is he 57, does he have a 57 percent approval overall, that poll showed that he has a 69 percent approval. Nice. Among nice. Uh, nice. Among uh, West Virginia Republicans. <laughs> And that's uh, that's it. That's the path to reelection. Is that if, if if you have that many Republicans in West Virginia liking you, you he actually might be able to get it done in a year where no other Democrat would win in West Virginia. The only thing from totally left field that I could see making Mansion kind of check himself is like a primary challenge from the left. And I know that there are people in West Virginia who are kind of AOC style Democrats, not many of them, but the ones that are there are like made of pretty strong stuff. Red state progressives are really, really tough. And uh, red state progressives coming out to get a primary challenger who's like far to the left of him to beat him would be something that could, you know, rattle him. Not that I necessarily want that to happen. I don't want to lose the seat. But um, that's the only thing that my, you know, poisoned brain can come up with as as putting any fear into him. But then also, you know, he can just cry himself to sleep on his bed of millions of dollars that he made off right. uh, pro profiting off of uh, pollution and, and coal interests. Look, I think there is, you know, you mentioned the financial interest there. I also think this guy is just very high on his own supply like he is there's a when i was in dc the other week i heard uh rumors from a couple different people that he's been telling people he might want to run for president in 2024 as the moderate alternative to joe biden which is fucking wild but also i think that like this guy has spent time not too much time in west virginia but like too much time in a lot of fucking green rooms and like uh, you know on yeah. cable shows and like fucking editorial boards and he really thinks that like he's this moderate champion that's gonna fucking save the country. Like I think he's uh, he's yeah. deluded himself. And if and if that's how he's thinking, I don't see how he jumps in on a Democrat only reconciliation bill at this point. Because mm -hmm. why would he help out the Democrats when he wants to either be the great bridge builder, you know, between parties, um, or be able to say, you know, the Democrats went too far left and I was able to kill it. Like it seems like those are more politically or at least he thinks those are more politically beneficial stances to take, which is just fucking infuriating. <sighs> I mean, that's why as any person like rises in the ranks through Washington, Hollywood, any like bullshit heavy space, it's really important for them to have one person around who they cannot fire who will tell them no. Yes. Or like I because I think Manchin has risen past the point where he has fired all of the people who will tell him no. Um, it's like Kanye syndrome in a way. You know, you you need somebody who's going to be like this. You are not – your view of what you think people see you as does not match with how you are seen. And, and West Virginia is not a large state. Right. He is immensely popular in a small state that is not necessarily in line with America as a whole. And, uh, yeah, that's that's – Yikes. That's a yikes. Yeah. I mean, it, it's tough for Democrats when your uh, 50th Senate vote comes from a guy who 
is not only representing an extremely conservative state, but maybe the only state in the country that is wholly dependent on one of the most damaging fossil fuels that you could imagine. <laughs> so it's like a, yeah. it's a pretty rough situation that I think we've all found ourselves in. And I mean, yes. and this brings up a question like, you know, Biden obviously promised a fairly sweeping agenda on the campaign trail, most of which has been held hostage by has bleh, most of which has been held hostage by uh, Mansion and Kirsten Cinema. Looking back, do you think there's anything he could have done differently? And then I guess looking forward how do Democrats sort of energize a base that may be disappointed by what hasn't gotten done? Yeah. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to Monday morning quarterback this or, you know, next two years later, April quarterback this. But I think that it was maybe a catch 22 for Biden because Biden had to either run as a uniter. And if you run as a uniter, then party doesn't matter. And you get to vote, you know, vote for your conscience, vote for who you think is the better person. Even if you're a Republican, come out, you can come out and vote for Joe Biden. He's a uniter. Or you run as like a party person that's like, we need to be in power as Democrats so that we can get the Democratic agenda passed. And I think Joe Biden really tried to walk the line between both where he's had he had this bold progressive agenda as a candidate, but he also tried to decouple the agenda slightly from the like national Democratic ticket, if that yeah. makes any sense, which I think was something that at the time looked as though he had to do. And I don't I don't know if things would have been different if it would have been like you got to get out there and vote for Democrats because who could have predicted that we would have ended up with a 50-50 Senate split. But the 2020 election was not good. It, we Democrats underperformed in the House and the Senate in 2020. And I think part of that is because there was like a you know, party doesn't matter, we can unite, you know, and and that's that's just patently not true. Yeah. I mean, look, could Joe Biden have set expectations lower at the beginning of his administration, knowing how, who Manchin is and knowing who Sinem is? Yeah, he could have. But then he would have rightly been accused of not fighting hard enough for Democratic priorities by people like us. I'm sure we would have done that, you know. And mm -hmm. so he sort of set, you know, he, he, he basically said, oh, this is going to be my big agenda and I'm going to try to fight for it. And I'm going to try to bring Manchin and Sinema along. Mm -hmm. I don't think that like... You know, I, I was for other candidates in the primary, but I don't think that like Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders or Pete Buttigieg or anyone else running would have had an easier time pressuring Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema just because right. like they 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 get a vote. They represent right. states where they clearly have made the calculation that thumbing their nose at the National Democratic Party and the president of the United States is not going to be as is, is not going to hurt them politically at home. Now, right. Manchin, I think, is correct in that assessment. Kirsten Cinema, I don't necessarily think is correct, but whatever. That's what she thinks. She's right just now, so. chaotic. She is a chaotic entity and it's impossible to figure out what she's what she's doing at any point. But I think the maybe the calculation here was that Biden could put these extremely popular policy proposal proposals out there and Americans would respond well to them. Like, look how popular this is. And then cinema and mansion would be moved by their better angels. And I'm using air quotes because, you know, Biden loves that that phrase um, to do the right thing. And that's not necessarily what they uh, are going to do or ever have done. And I wanted I'd want to just say one more thing. Um you know, the Lucy with the football comparison that is constantly coming up. It was coming up when during the Trump years. Now it's coming up in reference to, to Joe Manchin. We need a new reference. Gang. I know. It's getting very old. I, I love Greg Sargent. I, but <laughs> stop using that reference, Greg. Lucy with the football. How about, how about Jean Parmesan from Arrested Development? Because it's <laughs> like you get into a situation and some, all of a sudden he takes the mask off. It's Jean. Ah! You know, we get into a situation where we're negotiating. Joe Manchin is along for the ride. He takes off the mask. Ah, it's Joe Manchin. Ah, except, you know, we're not delighted by it. Um, that's my final thought on the matter. As you can see, extremely highfalutin. Look, I think that's a I think it's a great idea. I think when we're looking ahead to the midterms, you know, the best message is you kind of start from like what the truth is. And the truth of the matter is if we elect two more Senate Democrats then we don't have to worry about Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema. And I think right. if I was Joe Biden, I would have a message that both talks about what he's done, talks about what he hasn't been able to get done, primarily because Republicans won't work with him on anything, also because he has 
to Democratic senators who have been extremely difficult. And if you send him to more Democratic senators and you return a Democratic House majority, he will be able to get all the rest of his agenda passed. And by the way, if Republicans take over, nothing more will get done. And in fact, a lot of harm could possibly come to people because Mm -hmm. we might not be able to confirm judges and we might be able to confirm all that kind of stuff. So that, I mean, look, it is a more complicated message than anyone would certainly like, but that's sort of the reality that we're in right now. Yeah. And, and, you know, going back to some of the popular provisions that Biden uh, proposed that Manchin and Cinema have successfully sidelined, the care agenda is such a popular agenda. Um, and it was such a missed opportunity by Democrats. And I think that seriously, if Democrats just ran on, look, parental leave, family leave, um, a a bolstered care economy like somebody has to take care of all these kids somebody has to take care of all these these elderly people somebody has to take care of all these people who are suffering from long-term disability as a result of long covid like the thing between where we are and where we need to be is literally two senators and i mean not where we need to be but getting on the path to where we need to be because we're so egregiously behind um i think that that's a it, you're right. It's not necessarily a straight as an arrow message. You can't really put it on a bumper sticker. Um, you could, but it'd be a long bumper sticker. Um, but that's kind of what we're working with right now. Yeah, I would also bet that if the mansion thing, if and when the mansion bipartisan energy bullshit falls apart, and then you know if reconciliation should fall apart, you'll probably see a lot more executive actions from Joe Biden in addition to the student debt relief. And then, you know, he'll probably take his case to the voters in the Mm -hmm. in the summer and fall. The presenting sponsor of this episode of Pod Save America is Simply Safe Home Security. You guys know we love the break in protection that our Simply Safe Home Security gives us, but it's not always outside forces that you need Simply Safe's protection from. This is Joshua's story, a Simply Safe customer from Indiana. Wow, we got a story. Uh, A few months ago, he fell asleep with pizza rolls still in the oven. Been there. Who among us? This could have been disastrous, thousands of dollars in damages to his kitchen and home, or worse. Luckily, Joshua has a comprehensive, simply safe system equipped with everything to prevent break-ins and smoke detectors to sniff out fires. He's startled awake to the sound of a 95 decibel alarm from his Simply Safe base station. Seconds later, he got a call from Simply Safe Professional Monitoring. The pizza rolls didn't make it, (laughs) but Joshua did. Joshua did, guys. All right. Uh, He believes. Why would they include such a terrible story? Well, because he believes that Simply Safe probably saved his life that night. Love it. Have oh. you ever had a story like that with your Simply Safe? No, I keep an eye on those pizza rolls till they're fucking done. You know. But you also have Simply Safe, which has been a wonderful product for you. I do, yeah, and and I've also have Simply Safe, which has been a wonderful product for me. I'm a huge fan. I set it up Thank myself, you. and if I did happen to fall asleep with pizza rolls in the oven, which is okay, plausible, I'd be glad to have Simply Safe to uh, wake me up with the uh, whatever decibels they decide is best. Protecting people when their guard is down is just one of the reasons more than four million people use and love Simply Safe. With a comprehensive Simply Safe system and 24-7 professional monitoring, you always have someone looking out for you. Plans cost under $1 a day with no long-term contracts or hidden fees ever. You can customize the perfect system for your home in just a few minutes at simplysafe.com slash crooked. Go today and claim a free indoor security camera plus 20% off with interactive monitoring. Go to simplysafe.com slash crooked. Pod Save America is brought to you by Brooklinen. Who doesn't love a birthday? Cake, presents, and for Brooklinen, home of the internet's favorite sheets. Huge savings. To celebrate their eighth birthday, Brooklinen is gifting us with their biggest sale of the year happening now. The birthday sale is definitely something you'll be excited to unwrap. Every Brooklyn and product is 20% off. We're talking soft sheets, luxurious towels and robes, snugly weighted blankets, lavish silk eye masks and pillowcases. Lavish. There's something for everyone. Lavish. Which is nice. There's something for everyone in this sale. Brooklyn and was created in 2014 to give customers luxury hotel level home essentials that don't break the bank. They offer everything from snugly sheets to cozy towels and robes, loungewear, accessories, and much more. By working directly with suppliers, Brooklyn and cuts out the luxury markups and passes those savings back to their customers. So you get their incredible products at a reasonable cost. First time trying Brooklyn, in, their best selling Lux sheets are the perfect place to start, featuring an irresistibly soft feel and buttery smooth finish. Summer is so close, we can taste it. Get a head start with Brooklyn and cooling linen sheets, photo worthy beach towels, lightweight quilts, and more. And if you need the extra nudge to purchase, check the five-star reviews, over 100,000 of them. Yes, you heard that right, 100,000 five-star reviews. It must be really hard to believe. Um, We love Brooklyn, and 
I just we just put a new pair of Brooklyn and sheets on our bed, and I noticed the difference from our old stupid sheets immediately. <laughs> hey, John. Stupid sheets. What did the rude guest say right before he got kicked out of the Brooklyn and birthday party? What did he say? I don't give a sheet. Uh, <laughs> love <yuck>. his face. <laughs> yes, it's horrible. Love it. That's like that's a joke right up your alley. I can't believe you made a face like that. Uh, yeah, well, I, you think I like myself? What about our friendship? Is not what a about part of you've this known process. me for? You've, <laughs> yeah, hip- hypocrisy. <laughs> known me for fifteen years. When did you just think I discovered that I liked myself? <laughs> Therapy. <laughs> You know what we all like. Brooklyn Brooklyn and Sheets. Brooklyn and Sheets. Don't miss out. Brooklyn and's biggest sale of the year is here with 20% off everything. Listening after the sale, you can still save. Visit brooklynand.com and use promo code CROOKEDMEDIA for $20 off your purchase of $100. That's B-R-O-O-K-L-I-N-E-N.com. Promo code CROOKEDMEDIA. Pod Save America is brought to you by Outer Known. We love Outer Known here at Crooked Media, and not just for their clothing, but also for what they stand for. Outer Known is offering men's and women's clothing where style meets sustainability. Their mission is to provide great clothes that don't harm the environment. Outer Known only works with factories that pay fair living wages and provide safe working conditions. 95% of products are made from organic or recycled materials. Outer Known clothes are high quality, sustainable clothes, comfortable and fit great, timeless style made to last for multiple years. Our own Tommy Vitor. Looks fantastic and his outer known sweater wears it all the time. Actually, you got a couple now, right? I got two. Thank you for noticing. Of course. Of course. I'm I love them. They look they look great. They feel great. They're comfortable. Can't say enough. Outer known was founded by Pro Surfer and eleven time world champion, Kelly Slater. Best selling items are blanket shirt. That's an all time bestseller. The world's coziest shirt. Feels as good as it sounds. Many colors to choose from for men and women. Everyone should have a blanket shirt in their closet. They also got jumpsuits. Easy to get dressed in, flattering, fit perfectly, range of style. Go to OuterKnown.com today and enter the code CROOKED at checkout, and you'll get 25% off your full price order. That's OuterKnown.com, O-U-T-E-R-K-N-O-W-N.com. And remember to use the code CROOKED at checkout for 25% off. Check them out today, OuterKnown.com, and don't forget promo code CROOKED for 25% off. Um, All right, let's talk about the uh, shit show on the other side. Uh, On Tuesday's pod, we came to the conclusion that maybe... Kevin McCarthy's political future was safe after his groveling apology to Donald Trump about the audio recording where he told Republican House members that he'd had it with the former president and wanted him to resign. But it turns out there were more audio recordings. Uh, Let's take a listen. The other thing that we have to do is these members on either whatever position you are calling out other members, that stuff's got to stop, especially in this nature. So I get up right here. I'm going to call Gate. Tension is too high. The country is too crazy. I do not want to look back and think we caused something or we missed something and someone got hurt. Um, and I don't want to play politics with any of that. Yeah, a little too late, Kev. Uh, as you might imagine, some House Republicans weren't super happy about that clip. Matt Gates tweeted that McCarthy demonstrated, quote, the behavior of weak men, not leaders. Uh, Congressman Andy Biggs called the comments incredibly undermining. And here's what Tucker Carlson had to say on Fox Wednesday night. We do not mean, certainly, to suggest that it's only Democrats who favor censorship for political ends. Republican leaders support it, too. In a phone call reported today by The New York Times, for example... Congressman Kevin McCarthy of California told his close friend Liz Cheney that he hoped the social media companies would censor more conservative Republicans in Congress. Donald Trump, the sitting president, had already been silenced by those companies, but McCarthy wanted the tech oligarchs to do more, to force disobedient lawmakers off the Internet. Quote, quote, can't they take their Twitter accounts away too? Those are the tape-recorded words of Congressman Kevin McCarthy, a man who in private, turns out, sounds like an MSNBC contributor. And yet, unless conservatives get their act together right away, Kevin McCarthy, or one of his highly liberal allies, like Elise Stefanik, is very likely to be Speaker of the House in January. That would mean we will have a Republican Congress led by a puppet of the Democratic Party. Just, just amazing. Amazing. Why, why is Tucker Carlson's broadcast voice like the voice of a person reading a storybook to a child? <laughs> it's like the intonation is like, it is. and that's why we can't let more black people into Harvard. It's like Tucker. I yeah. mean, anyway, that's I. Yes. the thing. The thing about that is uh, Tucker's characterization of Lee Stefanik as is wild. highly liberal wild stuff is absolutely wild so there's 
a part of me that thinks, okay, well, I guess if Kevin McCarthy gets out of the way, I don't like Kevin McCarthy whatsoever. Uh, I think it'd be fun to watch him be sad um, and to have his greatest ambitions dashed by, you know, the the tiger that he has by the tail in the far right members of Congress that he's trying to wrangle. Um, but on the other hand, I think Tucker makes an interesting point because who's who's who are we talking would be Speaker of the House if not Kevin McCarthy? Like, how crazy are we talking here? I mean, this is look, I remember Dan and I talking about this when it went from Paul Ryan, who we had plenty of bad things to say about, uh, to Kevin McCarthy. And I remember thinking, I remember talking about it when we went from John Boehner to Paul Ryan. Like, each incarnation of a Republican House Speaker is only going to get more extreme if it's not Kevin McCarthy. Is it Steve Scalise? Like, it's, uh, they just, they just get, more extreme as you go down the line here. So it's not like I, I, I've I found myself feeling like how you do, which is yes, it's fun to watch Kevin McCarthy feel sad, but um, if Kevin McCarthy's not speaker, it's not like that's going to be beneficial in any way to the country because we're only going to have someone who's more extreme, and all of these people are going to have to bend the knee to Donald Trump and probably Tucker Carlson. Now, look, I guess apparently McCarthy went to the House caucus yesterday and met with members for the first time since this audio recording came out, and he got a standing ovation. Um, of, there was a few Freedom Caucus members who were still giving him shit and I think demanded an apology or whatever. But it does make me think that ultimately he might be able to survive this, but also him surviving this and becoming speaker means that he will only sort of go along with whatever Donald Trump wants and whatever the Freedom Caucus wants and whatever Tucker Carlson wants more so between now and uh, if he ever becomes speaker, God forbid. I think that him lying about the veracity of the New York Times story, oh, God, knowing that there was audio out there or like probably having some inkling that there was audio out there required an audacity and an ability to just manufacture your own truth that might have been a little bit uh, admir admirable to members of the Freedom Caucus. In a way, oh, him lying so, so... Like, that's like, what we need. We're, we're yeah, looking for that. Hell yeah, hell yeah. Look at this guy. Sh complete shamelessness. He just demonstrated the type of shamelessness that the modern GOP needs in a leader. It doesn't matter that maybe he was shit-talking Donald Trump as long as he's sufficiently groveled. Like, what we need is a person who can lie knowing that there are audio recordings of him doing the thing that he said he didn't do. Yeah. No, he's well. So Republican knives also appear to be out for our, our good pal Madison Cawthorn. Uh, you remember him? You watch him doing, you know, a key bump of cocaine right in front of you. A sexual get together at one of our homes. You should come. They're like a sexual get together. A sexual get. -together. Madison Cawthorn <laughs> calling orgies a sexual get together is my is my favorite quote of the last <laughs> month. Maybe a sexual get together is that Netflix and chill with like <laughs> <laughs> sexual get together. Um, yeah. He got in some trouble this week for uh, for bringing a, a loaded handgun to an airport for the second time. Uh, and he also may have violated federal insider trading laws because of a pump and dump scheme involving, and I'm not making this up, let's go Brandon cryptocurrency. <laughs> is, 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 Mad you... is Madison Cawthorn too good to be true? That's my question. Um... Yeah, I mean, there's other things that I think that that should be mentioned alongside of of the the Let's Go Brandon cryptocurrency, um, <laughs> which is when he when he lied about training for the Paralympics in a way that was very very easy for I actual Paralympians that. to debunk. Like he was posting all these things on his social media accounts about how he was training, and all these Paralympians were like, "No, he's not. He's not training. He's not going to the." Paralympics. He also lied about um, his heroics in a car accident that he that he tried to flee. I believe um, he uh, he's lied about a lot of things. He is not a person who tells the truth very often. Um, I <laughs> he also I believe uh, I don't know why I have like brain cells devoted that have like stuck around that are devoted to to memorizing Madison Cawthorn facts. But I think he was in co in college for one semester. And he dropped out because he had like a D average. He had a creepy reputation on campus for yeah. taking girls out and being like handsy and way over the top and, and crossing lines. And there's a lot going on with <laughs> Madison Cawthorn. There's a lot not going on with Madison Cawthorn. There's certainly not a lot going on. It, I find it very interesting that Republicans 
have turned on Cawthorn so quickly and harshly. There's now a super PAC affiliated with Republican North Carolina Senator Tom Tillis that's already running ads against him. And it, it, it sort of like, why, why do you think they're going after Cawthorn so fast and so harshly and not some of the other wing nuts like your, your Marjorie Taylor Green and your, your Lauren Boberts and your Steve Kings and all those people? I mean, this is going to sound very tinfoil hatty, but I'm nothing if not a paranoid person or somebody who's always trying to look for a subtext. My thought is that there is something that is well known to Republicans about Madison Cawthorn that they are just like, we need to get this guy out of here. Like there is something about him that oh, I you think, think there's something even worse than all of the stuff we've just some, talked about. I think that there must be something else that is damning, disqualifying, or harmful about Madison Cawthorn that is known to Republicans, or he's going to be seen as somebody who can carry forward more damage than the other people. Yeah. He's also not a particularly... I would imagine that, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene, for all of her wing nuttery, is an effective fundraiser for the GOP. She gets people to give money, which is nuts to me um what's that saying about a fool and his money being easily parted by marjorie taylor green um i i think that madison cawthorn is probably not really offering the status quo what it needs and is maybe more of a burden than a help and maybe bobert and marjorie taylor green are helping them in ways that they're just sort of like begrudgingly accepting of marjorie taylor green this week by the way said that the Catholic Church is being run by Satan because there's all kind there's like Catholic and Christian missionaries that are resettling immigrants and refugees. That's that's where Marjorie Taylor Greene was this week. But like no problem silence from Republicans on that. But Madison Cawthorn, you know, he's he's getting the uh, he's getting the boot. He's getting the super PAC money uh, <laughs> run against him. It's wild. Wait it's wild a shit. second. If the Catholic yeah. Church was run by Satan, why was like Easter so chill this year? <laughs> like Easter would have been a banger this year if Satan were running the Catholic Church. Like the it blessing is. in St. Peter's Square would have been just completely off the chain. It would have been. I do think that like the, people like McCarthy and other leaders of the Republican Party think that green and bobert and those people like command a large part of the base or at least have are, are admired by a large part of the base and they and madison Cawthorn probably doesn't have that connection so they can like fuck with him a little bit more um mm -hmm. which just goes to show you like who's who's really leading the republicans which is just you know the most extreme members of the party mm -hmm. uh, and they're and they're yeah. fine with that yeah, and I, I did want to add there was um, there was a comment that stuck out to me in a Madison Cawthorn story uh, either this week or last, and it was from a former aide of his that was like, Madison Cawthorn is a big old liar who lies about everything. And like the – I don't know. Every time I read a story where someone is like, yeah, but I can't say, I'm just like, there's something out there about Madison Cawthorn that we don't know yet that I think people are just like, let's get this guy out of here. What a headache. Well, stay tuned. Stay tuned. Um, all right. When we come back, we will have a special climate edition of Take Appreciator with the host of Crooked's newest podcast, Hot Take. Pod Save America is brought to you by Noom. Share a time when you felt trapped between two choices, but eventually found a totally different or better solution. I have a story. I was, um, I was once working at uh, some sort of 90s era romantic comedy place. Maybe it was a magazine. And uh, I was being pursued by uh, two equally handsome men, Chris Pine and whoever else is in that movie, where they're both spies. What movie? Anybody know what yeah, I'm talking about? Anyway, I choose Chris Pine. <laughs> <laughs> and I choose Noom. When we're on our weight loss journey, we're often faced with difficult decisions every day. We want to make the best choices for our health, but it isn't always easy. Noom Weight gives you the support and knowledge you need to make positive choices, even when it's difficult. By learning the psychology behind your habits and better understanding your relationship with food, you'll gain the wisdom you need to continue making long-term positive choices. It was Tom Hardy. I Noom choose Tom Hardy. <laughs> you choose Tom Hardy. And it was 2012's This Means War. Noom understands that everyone's weight loss journey is unique and what works for someone else doesn't necessarily mean it'll work for you. That's why Noom Weight uses a psychology-based approach that adapts to your lifestyle. Its flexible approach focuses on progress, not perfection, and allows you to work toward your goals at a pace that's comfortable for you. Anyone want to share some personal experiences with Noom? You know, if you're looking to, you know, whatever your health goals are, they're yours. You know, I wanted to lose a few pounds. I've lost like 15 pounds. And Noom, uh, there you go. Noom helps. Noom Weight makes it easy to start on your weight loss journey and stay on track. Noom's personalized lessons help you gain confidence with practical knowledge you can employ right away. With one-on-one -on -one coaching, 
You'll always have guidance and support on your journey. There's no need to worry about fitting Noom into your schedule. All you need is just 5, 10, or 15 minutes a day. And how much time you want to spend is entirely up to you. Start building better habits for healthier, long-term results. Sign up for your trial at Noom.com slash crooked. That's N-O-O-M dot com slash crooked. N-O-O-M dot com slash crooked to sign up for your trial. Pod Save America is brought to you by Future. Future believes that people motivate people. And having your own future coach isn't just the best approach. It's the only sustainable approach to your health and fitness. Future has built the most talented team of fitness coaches on the planet. And when you join Future, you get paired with the one that's right for you, your goals, and your experience. Think about all the things that would be ridiculous to teach yourself or to be an expert on without a mentor, teacher, or coach. A whole bunch of different things. Mm -hmm. Your coach will tailor your plans to your goals and balance consistency and motivation to set you up for long-term sustainable success. They will be there to celebrate your achievements and give you an extra push when you need it. We all know my coach, Gabe. Uh, He's fantastic. Gives me all the workouts I need. All the workouts. You know. You need. All the workouts I need. Changes them up every day. There's a lot of variety. Um, You know, it's been great. Future isn't a fancy piece of equipment. This isn't a get fit quick plan, and this isn't a YouTube video. With daily coaching and tailored workout plans, your future coach will support you through every step of your fitness journey. There's no risk to try Future, and right now you can get 50% off your first three months and cancel any time during the first 30 days at tryfuture.com slash crooked. That's tryfuture.com slash crooked. Pod Save America is brought to you by Article. Article has launched their new line of outdoor products for summer of 22. Think oversized statement loungers, streamlined dining pieces, and easy-to-style sofas for all your backyard needs. With 42 pieces, plus a selection of bestsellers from seasons past, Article has what you need to outfit the deck of your dreams this summer. Article combines the creation of a boutique furniture store with the comfort and simplicity of shopping online. Article's team of designers focuses on beautifully crafted pieces, quality materials, and durable construction. They're dedicated to a modern aesthetic of mid-century Scandinavian, industrial, and bohemian designs. Fast, affordable shipping is available across the USA and Canada and is free on orders over $999. All in-stock items are delivered in two weeks or less. They got fair prices. You save up to 30% over traditional retail prices. Article is able to keep their prices low by cutting out the middleman and Selling directly to you. No showrooms, no salespeople, and no retail markups. Article's offering our listeners $50 off their first purchase of $100 or more. To claim, visit article.com slash crooked, and the discount will be automatically applied at checkout. That's article.com slash crooked to get $50 off your first purchase of uh, $100 or more. All right. Before we go, um, we have a special climate edition of Take Appreciator, and we are joined by the hosts of Crooked's newest pod, Hot Take, Mary Annie's Hegler and Amy Westervelt. Uh, welcome to the pod. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for you. having us. Uh, we're so excited about Hot Take. It's such a good podcast. I'm so glad we've been thinking about a climate podcast forever. And you guys have done such an amazing job. And we're, we're very happy that you're part of the family. And everyone listening, uh, go please subscribe to Hot Take if you haven't already. Um, you will not regret it. Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, now this is the part of the segment where I, I hand it over to our chief take officer, Elijah Cohn. Hey, Mary. Hey, I mean, nice to meet you guys. Welcome to the network. We're going to play a special climate edition of the Take Appreciators. So just so you know how it works, I'm going to share some takes with you from out in the content industrial complex. The producers have seen <laughs> these takes. Our players have not. They'll give their reactions and rate them on a scale of one to four politicos, with four politicos being the most egregious. Can you do a half politico? Yeah, the, wow. you can give it. You yeah. can do any okay. decimal point percentage. There are no rules. Honestly, okay. great a great question. I can't believe none of us have ever thought about doing half a Politico. That's great. Yeah, I'm into it. Okay, let's see if I actually do it. <laughs> all right. Well, we're gonna start with a scorcher here. This one is a clip. All I'll say about it is I'm sorry in advance. Charlotte, go ahead. And as I've said before, and been mocked for it, the simple fact of the matter is over the course of the next hundred years, when you see all these maps, and it's like this area will be flooded and all those people will be dead. No, because they won't be living there. Because as it turns out, when the tide rises, people move inland. This is what has been happening throughout human history. Not a huge number of people were killed, presumably, when the land bridge between Russia and Alaska, that, that from which Sarah Palin could see, right? When, when that land bridge ended up being covered up in water, there weren't tens of thousands of people who died in that because it took thousands of years for that to be covered up by water. Slow-moving crises are not crises. They're problems, not emergencies. So, oh, wow. Hero? We're yes. starting with King Shapiro? <laughs> yes, I would recognize that nasal twang anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the network. 
work. Baptism by fire here. I've heard this a million times, but I'm legit speechless. Like who, like his whole thing is you're supposed to sell when their homes get flooded, people will sell them. But like to fucking who? <laughs> um, and also like there's only so much livable. I, this is so stupid. This is so incredibly stupid, but I also don't believe it's stupid. I don't believe Ben Shapiro is actually this stupid. I believe Ben Shapiro is this heartless and he masquerades it in stupidity. He knows everybody can't move. He knows like he just doesn't care about those people and he doesn't think that their lives matter. So the bottom right. line is, fuck Ben Shapiro. I never want to hear that voice again. Oh, God. But how many politicos, Mary? <laughs> Four and a half. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's a that's a full that's a full playbook and a half. I would I would also give it a full playbook because I think that um I agree that Ben Shapiro is not stupid and I agree that he's heartless, but I also think he's strategic and this is like a very compelling talking point for people like, "Oh yeah, that's true. People will just move. How? Who's going to help them move? Do they have and the money to, to move?" Where are they going to move? And are we going to accept all those people coming into this country that need to move because of sea level rise? Because I'm pretty sure Ben Shapiro says no. <laughs> so, so yeah, I agree. For maybe 4.25. I don't, I'll go slightly less. Than Mary. Yeah. Um, this is one of the one of the more awful Ben Shapiro takes. It is a classic, of course. Um, but yeah, the idea that. Also, that like just like everyone has the resources to just pick up and move and buy, just just move to their second or third homes uh, when their first home floods is completely insane. And it is, I, I think, to Mary, what you were saying, like he's just so much of climate denial. I think is just justification for not giving a shit because you think, well, in my lifetime, I'm going to get through it, and everyone else, well, screw them. That's it. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm giving that the full playbook for sure. Love starting off with a clean sweep, full playbook, and just a little reminder that Ben Shapiro's company is funded in part by oil and fracking billionaires, so he's not an objective commenter on this topic. I am scared for the next one. <laughs> I know this is where we started. <laughs> well, the next one, I think, is doing this segment, I've learned a lot about the current discussion on climate change. So this next one isn't so much politicos. We're going to need to change the scale here to science fiction like one to four science fictions. So this is a piece from the New York Times titled, What's the Least Bad Way to Cool the Planet? The piece explains that we can stop making climate, uh, climate change worse through reducing emissions, but repairing the damage is its own problem. It leads us to this quote, to cool the planet in this century, humans must either remove carbon from the air or use solar geoengineering a temporary measure that may reduce peak temperatures, extreme storms, and other climates, uh, climatic changes. Humans might make the planet more reflective by adding tiny sulfuric acid droplets to the stratosphere, stratosphere from aircraft, whitening low-level clouds over the ocean, or other uh, interventions. And then it goes on to explain the merits of solar geoengineering. Guys, I mean, putting... <sighs> sulfuric acid droplets into the sky is this legit or is this just complete science fiction here okay can i take this one because this is this has literally been going on for like 20 years these guys trot this idea out every few years and um there is actually there's supposed to be a real world um, experiment with this over Sweden. I don't know if you've heard about this in your research, Elijah, <laughs> but Harvard um, was doing an experiment in a tube for a while. And they're like, we need to do this in the real world. Um, and the people of Sweden, of course, are like, maybe somewhere else. Um, <laughs> uh, because one of the, the many things that's potentially wrong with geoengineering, A, like, we just don't know what other things might happen. This has only been tested in labs. And that's part of why the scientists were saying we need to test this in the real world, because we just don't know. And part of their reasoning also was that they were, I think, probably accurately predicting that at some point, some psychopathic autocrat will be like, fuck it, let's just geoengineer. <laughs> and, and we need to know like what that will actually do. To the planet so um so it is actually a thing that people have been studying for a long time unfortunately i think it's something that a lot of tech billionaires have been investing in because it's like the ultimate get out of jail free card um it's not because it's the best solution and this is also why i feel like 
tech billionaires are a problem when they invest in these things in general, because it's, it's basically like pointing policy in a direction that suits them, not necessarily the direction that science says, so this is an actually good solution. Um, looking for the, looking for the easy way out. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's like the tech equivalent of a bunker in New Zealand. Um, you know, that's it. <laughs> So I guess four science fictions, um, actually maybe yeah. three because it's like legit science and there is some like, you know, validity to the science. And I do actually think it'd be helpful to understand how it works because I, I agree that I think some psycho will pull the ripcord at some point, but is it a good solution? No, it's not. Yeah. My, my first reaction is that, you know, we have so many tools at our disposal um, to to get out of global warming or not get out of it, but to reduce greenhouse gas emissions that we are simply not using. Um, right. And so I feel like we got a lot of other shit to try before we go turning off the sun. Um, and so that, <laughs> that gives me pause. Um, just dim I, it, Mary. Just dim it. Yeah. Hey, just, you know, put it on level three or something. What? Um, but yeah. also it's like big tech has uh, disrupted a lot of things. It has not solved a lot of things. It's disrupted the media and created this world where like we have different realities, <laughs> you know? So like they've disrupted dating and I want a personal response, a personal apology for that. I don't want them <laughs> disrupting earth. These people don't have a good, good track record. They don't like <laughs> understand problems before they go solving them so like i i want big tech to disrupt itself before it goes disrupting the the, <laughs> yeah. the ecosystem yes yeah so i don't know how many science fictions that is it's more like a sit down <laughs> <laughs> i'm um i'm gonna give it i'm gonna give it two and a half based only on you know, on take appreciators, take appreciators usually like we give a lot of politicos for people who are like purposely trying to troll because they're so right. bad. And I feel like I feel like this this article wasn't really trying that hard. It was just sort of um, it was a little bit of wish casting. It sounds like <laughs> from the science. So they get yeah. they get two and a half just for being a bunch of uh, knuckleheads. Fair. Well, I got a, a, a really good trolley one coming up. But before we get to it, I just wanted to ask you guys, I'm genuinely curious after prepping for this segment, how do you guys view mitigation versus uh, adaptation, mm -hmm. that whole debate? It's not a debate. It's a false debate. Yeah. It's a both and. You have to do both. That's yeah. like the simplest answer is just like, yeah, of course, it, yeah. it makes no sense to stop trying to reduce emissions. It also makes no sense to just do nothing about the fact that we're already seeing heat waves and more fires and floods and all of that stuff. You right. Know, you gotta do all of it. The fact that that debate still exists means that they're like, we're stuck in this world where we don't think global warming has happened. You know, like the earth right. has already warmed by a degree. So if you're still debating this in like the 1990s when I, well, actually I think the world hadn't warmed by that point, but if you, not this it, much it's sort though. of, yeah, right, right. Not to this like dangerous point where you're getting hurricanes that evolve overnight. Um, so I think that when we propose mitigation and adaptation as being in conflict with one another, uh, we don't, we're not recognizing how the world that we live in is actually a different planet than the one we were born on. Cool. Well, scary, but All right, troll us, to think troll about us. it. Cool. Here we go. Here okay. we go. <laughs> <laughs> well, this last one is so hot. It melt, it might melt the ice caps itself. It's from Fox news. Oh man. Oh. Elijah. Dude. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Come I'm on. sorry. <laughs> it's a piece called Climate Change is Saving Hundreds and Thousands of Lives or Hundreds of Thousands of Lives. Here's Can a we quote. turn this into, okay, stop. <laughs> 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 it, here's a quote. Sorry. More people died from cold weather than hot. A new Lancet study reports that while half a million people die from heat per year, roughly 4.5 million die from cold. Global warming has reduced the intensity of extreme cold weather. Uh, now we see fewer cold deaths. Guys. Oh, my God. Who said oh it? Oh, my God. Um, who said it? Tucker Carlson? Good guess. Nope. Hannity? <laughs> Not Hannity. I don't know mm. anyone's name over there. Just, uh, Jesse Waters. Close. Uh, Greg Gutfeld. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there we go. You just have to go down the list of idiots till you get stupider and stupider. You know what? That gets a full playbook for sure because that is 
just an I mean it's a tried and true trick, right? That like it's not the warming, yeah. it's the it's the cold and it's actually it's good sort of, for us. Yeah, yeah, basing it all on weather. <laughs> um so but you know what the way that he did that, saving lives, that's that's a take to be appreciated. That gets a full playbook. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a intentional troll. It reminds me of there was this period of time, actually I think they still do it occasionally where um like the hardcore climate deniers would say actually more CO2 is good because it'll grow more plants. Um <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's on par with that uh so yeah i agree full playbook i'm gonna give it two playbooks because what? yeah i, I like am this. breaking all like of the this. rules i'm breaking all of the rules um and i'm doing so because one it is stupid um but it's also in incredibly dangerous and i don't believe it's genuine i don't believe the person who said this i don't believe the person who wrote this i don't believe the person who wrote who produced this segment believes this I, I absolutely 1000% don't just like they knew that the insurrection, you know, was dangerous and people like all what we know about what they say in private and what they say in public is wildly different. These people are right. not this stupid. They're not this stupid. They're just this evil and this craven. So, yeah, yeah. two playbooks. And nice. maybe a swift kick in the nuts. This is our this is our first two playbook. Yeah, well, this is definitely <laughs> our first two playbook plus swift kick in the nuts on take a yes. Here, So yes. Yeah. Well, and then also they're taking legit research in the Lancet and trying to spin it as like pr a proof point of climate denial, you know, like just ugh, gross. Right. So they read the research. They know better. They know yeah. full fucking better. I guarantee they're not buying coastal property in Florida or anything like That's that. That's right. They, yeah. they are not they buying a, a Miami beach house right, right now. Yeah. It's like, what was that? <laughs> what was that Republican strategist who like all Red of a sudden is like my, yeah, that dude. It's like, all of a sudden, my bad. I lied to y'all about climate change. You knew it the whole time. I got a house in New Zealand. Good luck. Fuck y'all. Yeah. yeah. They know what they're doing. Of course they do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And on a purely execution standpoint, Greg Gutfeld is kind of a try hard. You know, you got to be more subtle than that, in my opinion. So. <laughs> Not subtle enough for you, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know I played Shapiro earlier, and I mean, that's the least subtle guy out there, but. <laughs> Anyway, welcome to the network, guys, and I'm sorry. Th thank yeah, you. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thanks, Elijah, as always. Thanks, Mary Annie Hegler and Amy Westervelt. And thank you, Aaron Ryan, for co-hosting today. Thank you, everyone. Uh, have a great weekend, and we will talk to you next week. If you're not listening yet to uh, What a Day, you're missing out. Crooked's daily news podcast will help break down the most important stories you may have missed in only 20 minutes. Listen to new episodes of What a Day every Monday through Friday, wherever you get your podcasts. And next week, Pod Save America Alive and on tour will be in Chicago and St. Louis. Tickets are on sale now. Find your city and date at crooked.com slash events.